The Simpsons Index, an online spreadsheet that is also a podcast. This is The Podcast. Coming to you out of SideQuest Studios, this is The Simpsons Index, episode 252. Hello out there, I'm your host Elliot J. O'Neill. Joined as always, except when he's not, is BT Callaway. Ahoy. Ahoy. And joining us for the first time is Zeit Poltergeist, aka Beck. Hello everybody, so good to be here. Thank you for joining us for the Simpsons Index. And of course, this is a podcast that reviews Simpsons, old and new, mostly new these days. And we mm-hmm. bring on a wonderful guest each and every time to help us do so. And so, yes, bring Beck into the fold today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and yeah, listeners of the last year at least will know uh, I've been spruiking the dreaded GM Twitch channel of mm-hmm. where I've been streaming with Beck doing our Call of Cthulhu campaign. And that's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes. So much fun. Very spooky times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, Well, how would you describe it to the people out there? What if we'd be doing over there at Dread's channel? Yeah, it's Call of Cthulhu. It's a tabletop role-playing game, so in the same vein as something like Dungeons & Dragons, but um, definitely more of a kind of Lovecraftian, eldritch horror sort of vibe. So over the past year, we've been um, essentially steadily losing our minds, I guess, haven't we? <laughs> <Huzzah>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, but yeah, once the main campaign ended last year, we had a couple of like special edition episodes and streams mm-hmm. with Dread where we did some like one shot campaigns. And yeah, you ran a fantastic Vampire the Masquerade campaign for uh, us. Yeah, <laughs> it was very political, wasn't it? I don't yeah. know retrospectively <laughs> whether I should have started off with something so like politics heavy, but it was a vibe. It was no, fun. it was it was my first time <laughs> playing Vampire, and it's just such an interesting, different system than yeah, mm. certainly any other ones we've been playing. Like Call of Cthulhu, it was a pretty easy transition from like I'd been playing D anD D for years, yeah. but yeah, Vampire, different beast altogether. It exists in its own little realm for sure. Yeah, it's quite, mm-hmm. it's its own beast. Yeah, yeah, in its sure. own little world of darkness. <sighs> If you will. <laughs> Fangs out. Um, so, yeah, and you mostly running uh, vampire campaigns over at your YouTube channel, Zeit Poltergeist, yeah? Um, yes, I've got a new one coming out um, that I've been talking about for ages. I just haven't got around to editing it because I've been so busy. But um, there's one coming out um, that we've been working on set in Australia, which um, mm-hmm. is fairly underrepresented in the world of vampire. Most of the games that you see around are either set in America or Europe, but um, mm. I thought I'd bring a bit of, you know, Aussiness to the system because um, all Excellent. of the games, or at least most of them, are, you know, set in the real world um, in some capacity, just a sort of dark supernatural mm. version of the real world. So, um, yeah, hopefully within the next couple of weeks um, there'll be some movement um, in that regard. But, yeah, we've been working on it for a bit. It's been um, a lot of fun. No, that's awesome. So you're setting it in Melbourne? Um, it's in Victoria, but I'm um, in rural Victoria, so not uh-huh. in Melbourne, but surrounding. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because yeah, our fellow streamer uh, Sean of Roltercast, yeah, had mm-hmm. uh, his vampire Adelaide the masquerade. Night. Yeah, Adelaide by night, mm. and that was very much set in the city. So yeah, yeah, doing rural sounds pretty interesting. I'm curious about yeah, that. Yeah, more of like a small town murder mystery mm. sort of Twin Peaksy thing. That's Excellent. what I was going for anyway. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, so yeah, everybody, go check that out over at Zeit Bolter, guys. But for now, we're here to talk Simpsons, and yeah, before we hook into the episode review proper, we like to our turn to our first time guests and ask what is your simpsons history where did the show begin with you yeah when you asked me to do this elliot it was interesting because when i was a kid i was never allowed to watch it right it was Uh, one of those kids one of those families that's yeah Yeah. that was my upbringing (laughs) so i I never really um interacted much with it until i was i guess a teenager and only then you know when i saw an episode on tv or something so my experience watching the episodes is very sort of mismatched hodgepodge like I haven't Mm. sat down and watched it from start to finish like I hear that this is like the 252nd episode that you're doing and it's just kind of baffling actually that I've managed to (laughs) bypass so much of this huge cultural phenomenon that everybody Mm. references so much and so much of the references go way over my head because I am 
I'm a newcomer, shall we say, to the, yeah, uh, yeah. To the yeah. Simpsons I world. I feel like it needs clarification that it's the 252nd episode of this podcast, but we've covered 670 episodes of The Simpsons. Oh, yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to daunt you a little bit more on the extent of this show. Well, I mean, it that is like the weird challenge. thing. Like, <laughs> few shows get 250 episodes, and that we've gotten 250 episodes of a podcast where we were f- mostly reviewing multiple episodes per podcast. Like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's a tad ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, that it's been going on for like decades and decades and decades at this yeah. point, right? Yeah. Four of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we used to review uh, three episodes, one from each decade, um, to sort of have the point of comparison, but we got Dan caught up, so now we're yep. just reviewing newer ones. So <laughs> I'm very interested in your perspective on this one we hmm. reviewed today because, like, uh, uh, I mean, we're going to get into it, especially because there's, like, a pretty major character retcon going on throughout all Mm -hmm. this so like and you know we've often wondered how does this show exist in a bubble for those that don't have the heavy nostalgia for the classic era and like will uh, turn their nose up at these newer episodes and go oh that's not the character i know and love sarah wiggum wouldn't do that yeah um so yeah okay so there's lore around her because this is the only time i've ever ever seen her in an episode of anything yeah (laughs) we'll 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 discuss (laughs) like not much but i mean yeah yeah let's get into it. it's noticeable uh so yeah today we are watching uh yeah and i did write this down the 701st episode of the simpsons mm. <laughs> uh so this was season 32 episode 17 uncut fems first released in march of 2021 it was directed by chris clements written by christine nangle in this episode marge and sarah wiggum bond but then they get kidnapped by sarah's old friends and it turns out sarah wiggum wife of a cop used to be a thief and uh dun, dun, dun. and yeah it's a whole big heist episode you know she's out mm. of the game but her old team bring her is they brought her back in you know and for one more score just when you think you're out <laughs> that's it and they're doing a big heist on the met gala and a bunch of other stuff happens hey what did we think uh, pretty positive on this one, actually. I started off, you know, meandering around and, uh, you know, this blew, we maybe didn't get some big laughs, but definitely blew the air out of my nose a couple of times. But by the time second act rolls around, I'm like, okay, I'm actually having some fun. Maybe I'm just a sucker for a heist because I am a sucker for a heist. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, there are some weird retcon things we will discuss, but outside of that, I had a pretty good time with this one. How about you, Beck? Um, yeah, I had fun with it. I uh, watched it on the train on the way to uni this morning and I was chuckling to myself a little bit on the train like um, at particular moments. Um, I thought the story was good. The heist thing was not what I expected. I, I like assumed that the title is a, a play off of Uncut Gems and I know that's mm. sort of like a, a heist crime sort of film and stuff like that, but I haven't seen it. I mean, oh. if I've only watched half of it, and no, it's not. It's way more boring than that. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm glad I watched this instead of that then. <laughs> no, I, I was feeling bad because, like, yeah, I, I plan to watch Uncut Gems because everyone like has such a mixed opinion of that, and I, it's one of those movies that I'm fascinated by the mixed yeah. um, mm-hmm. that I want to know what I think of it, but yeah, look, I just yeah, look, ran out of again, time. I haven't finished it, to be fair, but also I feel like my review gets summed up by this you know, tweet that was going around that just said, quite frankly, if I was him, I wouldn't have done any of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to watch a guy I don't like make decisions I don't think are a good idea, and I'm supposed to want him to not die? Sure. Mm. I don't get it. <laughs> it's hard to get behind the, the main mm. character. I have heard mm. a few people yep. say that. Uh, I mean, yeah. I just have a hard time getting behind anything Adam Sandler, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, we all do, but every now and then. Yeah, I, I've just been, <laughs> I was burnt in the past, but you know what? A lot of people say the same thing about The Simpsons. They love the early years and whatever. Mm. But um, yeah, let's get into the questionnaire then. Uh, we'll start with you, Beck. For better or worse, what is just a moment from this episode that stands out to you, for better or worse? Um, the beginning, actually. Um, yeah? I don't know what I was expecting from the beginning of the episode, but like the whole, you know, I'm going to whistleblow. No, you're not. Here are some free tickets was very like, I don't know. I was kind mm. of just reminded of an old job that I was working a few years ago and I'd worked like over 1500 hours throughout the whole year. And they, um, as a reward, they gave me like two twenty dollar vouchers to spend at Kmart or something. And so <laughs> yeah, uh, it was kind of like. A version of that it's like don't whistle blow don't put our company under here are a couple of free tickets to see a show i'm like oh that just hit me it was real i i thought it was a really fun strong 
kind of like oh relatable beginning <laughs> yeah well i mean it's nice that carl's very excited over it but yeah he really should have pushed the point a bit more <laughs> yeah i do like his point of i've seen my fair share of workplace atrocities before and smith is just like here's an nda yeah <laughs> here's one i prepared earlier <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah the the whole response is well i never thought i'd say this but what can you give me you know Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, that was pretty good. Um, that said, there's something weird about it being tickets to Bob Seger. I don't know. Um, Did that hit you as strange, Elliot? It, uh, again, we've been told many times when we're critical of the newer seasons that, oh, look, you just don't get it. It's a different humor for a different generation. Kids don't know who the fuck Bob Seger is. I barely know who the fuck Bob Seger is. I had to look him up. <laughs> <laughs> well, there goes the next question. What are your favorite top five Bob Seger songs? <laughs> it's Night Moves and then Turn the Stereo Off. <laughs> I'll turn the pages, okay? <laughs> Metallica did it better. Oh yeah. There. Even their night moves, I think Tina Fey did it better. Night cheese. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Working on my night, night cheese. cheese. <laughs> yeah, so uh w- the one thing that stood out to me from that was that the character model that they used for Bob Seeger looked a lot like the Simpsons model for Matt Groening, the creator. A little bit. Oh. But I mean they do kinda look similar. Yeah. I mean, uh, old white guy with a goatee, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's only so Yeah, many. but like a salt and pepper goatee as well. So <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, as like not current as the reference was, it would make sense for, you know, people of Homer and Wiggum's age, I, I guess. guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to get true. excited about that. Sort of Gen X. Well, mm-hmm. even then, I think Bob Seeger's a little older, but yeah, he's like, like 70. I mean, we're at the stage now where Homer's technically a millennial, which feels weird. Oh, like, no. yeah. T- never think oh. about time in The Simpsons. <laughs> it will hurt your head too much. No, I prefer this version where, oh, yeah, that that's boomer music. He can, yeah. That tracks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of why I let it slide, but I was still like, really? Bob? Okay, we're getting excited about Bob Seeger. All right. Well, look, sure. and yeah, playing himself in this episode, Bob Seeger. Yeah. I didn't actually mind his little, like, conversation with Homer and Wiggum as well, where, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. yeah, he was really disappointed in them. I just love this idea of subverting rock stars into just really boring, you know, ultra morale people. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. like the Who, and they're like, oh, no, we didn't trash the hotel room. We we made a sacred bond with the hotel staff. Sacred Sacred bond. bond. (laughs) Yeah, or like Alice Cooper in Wayne's World, you know, just (laughs) talking about... (laughs) Milwaukee, the good land. (laughs) Yeah, I just love this subversion of rock stars like that but yeah also Hmm. to sort of drive the emotion of the story where yeah homer and wiggum realized they're being jerks yeah Yeah, i liked their redemption arc actually Mm. yeah and the fact that followed through as well is very good and yeah yeah a Uh, lot of what we're going to be saying back is today is like this is surprisingly competent for this era of the simpsons (laughs) (laughs) they're getting basic storytelling right what the fuck is happening there's actually an arc yeah (laughs) Oh, heresy, my God. Uh, how about you, BT? What stands out to you from this episode, for better or worse? Uh, I mean, that, for starters, coherency. Um, the other one, you know, I'm going to th- throw a little little uh, standout moment to this, is the fact they made a gender-fluid joke that wasn't cringe and terrible. <laughs> Maybe you had a different opinion, but they're, like, watching the, you know, the Gen Gala or whatever, and they're like, you know, who? look at that gender fluidity. Yeah, I wouldn't mind asking them for their pronouns. And I'm like... That seems like a fairly respectable way to make pull a gender fluid joke. I mean, I feel like previous Simpsons, it would have been, oh yeah, mama. It's like, you know, that's a guy, right? Ah, feels like that would have been 10 years ago. Whereas this feels a lot safer. Well, not safe is not the word I want, but more respectful while still being a joke. <laughs> They're ogling in a woke way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That. They're looking disrespectfully, <laughs> respectfully. Wokefully ogling, woggling, if you will. <laughs> sure. Um, it does kickstart maybe like uh, the weakest part of the episode for me anyway, maybe you guys have a different opinion, is the introduction of the mobsters and once again mm-hmm. returning guest Joe Mantegna as Fat Tony. Yeah, and look, it does also come with my biggest down arrow, which is again a misuse of t- um, what was it Johnny Tight Lips. Yeah. I uh, don't yeah, know if so, you're aware of the character Johnny Tight Lips, Beck, but no. as he says in the name, he generally has tight lips. Uh-huh. Yeah, generally he doesn't he doesn't give anything away. Yeah, like I mean, I guess from a story point, it does make sense because Sarah set up that yeah, he's not the uh, Chief Wiggum isn't the best police officer, but uh, you know, so this would be the lead he'd chase. And yeah, I, I didn't oh, mind Fat Tony's reasoning of like. Sarah is in trouble? No, I, of course I haven't, haven't anything to do with it. I want him to be healthy and happy. Yeah. So then that way, if I need to threaten you, I can say it would be a shame if they weren't. Yeah, mm. they absolutely want to keep Chief Wiggum in because he, they can keep getting away with things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but then, yeah, uh, the little subplot with um, Fat Tony adopting Ralph. Yeah, oh, look, that felt was... a bit rushed, like unrealized in a way. Like they oh, wanted definitely to do unrealized. But... I did like Homer and William coming back later, and they just do matching coats. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, also the line of, um, oh, we have a lot in common. We both don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> but as always here, we uh, always crap on the extra sketch that happens in the credits or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah, they're uh, just Ralph and Fat Tony at the ice cream store. It just, I don't know, It's it wasn't very funny. No. no, it does nothing, but I also didn't hate it, so. If the boy wants to smush, he will smush. Yeah. Yeah, and I again, it could have worked for me if they'd left on "Come along, Ralphie," squish the sticky hands or something like that, giving him a mod na- mob name. But then the fact that Ralph like yeah. touches his coat and gets dragged, it's like, no, no, I don't need the visual. the The joke itself was enough. I mm-hmm. get it. He has sticky hands because he's you know touching mm-hmm. everything like a child. Yeah, I, I don't know. It was just a weird addition to the episode, which. I don't know, for so many things that felt purposeful, it's just, yeah, this lacked purpose and then, yeah, didn't have enough good follow-up jokes to, yeah, um, I don't know, make me feel like well, it's, it a, it's it. enough to say Wiggum would instantly suspect the mob and then find out that, no, no, they love you. They don't want you to, you know, they want you to stay right there. You and your family are safe by them because, you know, otherwise you, they, you might get someone competent. Um, <laughs> it just did kind of need to move on, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Um, and what stands out to me, uh, look, I gotta say, it's gonna be the cast of this one because this is stacked with guest stars. Uh, oh, really? Um, so yeah, playing Bet and Erin, which were Sarah Wiggum's old uh, heist partner friends. Uh, first mm-hmm. of all, is Natasha Rothwell. You might know her from The White Lotus, and she was the sassy older sister in Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> nope, don't know. Her. I'm pretty sure you saw Sonic the Hedgehog with I me. I did. We saw it together. I don't, didn't mean to remember much of it. It was the last movie I saw before we all got locked down. Um, and then, yeah, playing Aaron was Tia Serka, uh, who played Vicky in The Good Place. Oh, right. That was brief. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Well, so was their appearance in this episode. They yeah. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have much. That's true. They didn't have much character, but I guess they were just playing the heist team. That's, yeah, that's all they that's really fine. needed to do. Yep. Yeah. Be a vehicle for that. But yeah, so uh, leaning into the retcon. Um, oh, so first of all, I'll mention that Nick Offerman was returning as Captain I Bowditch. I thought it was him. But like, oh. it didn't sound entirely Nick Offerman, just a little bit. Yeah, um, that's interesting because I'm like, but I maybe recognize I'm just, that voice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But maybe I'm too used to Ron Swanson and not Nick Offerman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you can hear parts of it, but mm. it's always weird. It's like Kevin from The Office when you hear their regular voice. It's like, oh, you don't talk like that. Oh. Weird. But it's like, oh, of course you don't. You're an actor. Like, <laughs> um, But yeah, uh, we previously saw him in a season 26 episode. I forgot which one it was. I didn't write it down. Yeah, but joining uh, Nick Offerman as well is his wife, who is now officially Sarah Wiggum. She uh, has oh. been in four episodes as of date now, and she is just now playing Sarah Wiggum. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. You forgot to say her name. Oh, Megan Mullally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know who it is, but for the audience at home, Elliot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, how do we think uh, Megan Mullally did as Sarah Wiggum? I mean, fine. Didn't have any, like, really killer lines or anything, so... And yeah, I was kind of very much distracted by the recast, because, yeah, she's been in it before as Sarah Wiggum, but Sarah Wiggum has not had this many lines ever. No. So I was definitely distracted by that, but, you know solid job yeah like from my perspective as somebody who's never seen an episode with sarah before i think it was good like the Mm -hmm. lines themselves were kind of flat sometimes but the delivery themselves i think was as good as they could have been nothing wrong with them just wasn't anything terribly memorable about them yeah yeah well i mean it's an interesting choice that they've made and like simpsons producers and uh, uh directors whatever have gone on record to say you know it's a wibbly wobbly continuity you know mm. so this is the weird thing with a character retcon in this episode because it's mm. not like sarah wiggum ever had a feature episode or was ever the subject yeah. of a story or yeah had anything more than just a supporting line or two fancy use the remote yeah exactly or so I kind of like the idea that they start her out like with everybody saying that she's boring, there's not much to her, because mm. that sort of fits. And then yeah. like her one word answers to Marge, I guess like okay, that sort of feels like it, but because it sounds so sharply different from what we've like heard in the past, it, it does still yeah. just feel weird. Yeah, mm. and she's also had a redesign as well, so she's usually much more spherical. And yeah. here she isn't. And which again works with what they need for this episode, but it just needed a 
bit more of a, I guess, like you didn't need to break continuity there because she does say something about, you know, uh, you do your best to keep in shape. And it's like, you didn't until this season, but okay. Right, um, that's interesting. So something about, I don't know, you have a couple of kids, you you let yourself go a little bit, and then you kind of uh, retune the machine. I don't know, something. Mm. Um, no, I mean, it, it is an interesting character thing, though, that she manages to find common ground with Marge. And mm. while I think that the story point of Sarah Wiggum changed the clocks so the children went to bed early... I yeah. <laughs> don't buy this for a fucking second. No. Yeah, because they're being supervised by someone else. And also, you know, you can tell children it's time to go to bed if they ain't sleepy. <laughs> Not sleeping. <laughs> exactly. And kids like are very aware of like what the sun means. Yeah. Like, <laughs> And they also have watches yeah. and phones. And their body clocks. <laughs> yeah, th- she changed mm. one clock. Yeah. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, this was one where I felt like this, like... What that was a little first draft, like because mm. you don't you don't need it either. You don't need to send the kids to bed early. All no. you need is for chaperone duty to be like over for the night because all the kids are asleep. Yeah, and then Sarah Wiggum cracks out a bottle and has a drink, and all of a sudden she her personality comes out, which does imply she's drunk for the rest of the episode. But okay, that's right because she's loud and assured mm. for the rest of the, yeah. yeah. I think mm. it probably would have been better to have her stay quiet and reserved up until the kidnapping and then after mm. that be like oh look this is why i always never made drew any attention to myself because i knew people were after me yeah the real like oh the one time i let my guard down moment sort of thing yeah, yeah. exactly that that would have worked better for me so already working on the things you would change segment but uh hey we just workshop <laughs> that <laughs> often what we do <laughs> um but uh did i have any other notes for guest stars Oh, yeah, so, yeah, in their effort to make sure that people of colour are now being voiced by said race and not just uh, Hank Azaria or whatever other white person's around the office. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, Tony Rodriguez, this is his first time as uh, Julio now that he's been recast. Oh, yeah. And uh, Dawn Lewis as well is now Benice Hibbard. Yep. You might know Dawn Lewis from Futurama has who played... Uh, La Barbara. La Barbara, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, moving on with the questionnaire, we like to talk about, like, the two pillars of what makes a great Simpsons. You know, back in the classic era, we always thought that they had a great balance of wackiness and hard. So, mm-hmm. starting out, how was the wackiness in this episode? How'd they use, like, the cartoony space? What were the wacky moments? Uh, I'm going to say Lindsay Nagel, very much Homer falling down those stairs. Yeah. Yeah, true. Um, I don't know. This was a bit too silly for me and i'm a very silly man <laughs> yeah uh, it didn't really quite fit and especially as it gets to the end and rainier wolf castles with another woman already and like, you are falling for a very long time mm. it didn't have much context or anything yeah it just sort of happened didn't it i was actually wanting to ask you guys like what you thought of this because i thought that Lindsay nagel was pretty underserved in this episode where she could have been like a bit more of an antagonist yeah. actively no mm. definitely it's all comeuppance but we've never seen her be bad so yeah. it's all you know, the 20 years ago bad she's done. Yeah, and right. it's not quite... Like, the most we get is when Marge sits ne- next door and she's like, oh, you're not famous, so bugger off. Yeah. Or whatever. Weird part is, actually, when Renya Wolfcastle goes, oh, Lindsay, stop talking to that empty chair. Um, mm-hmm. I just... what Have you guys seen the other two? It's a show. I think no. it's on Binge. No. But, yeah, anyway, they just had a whole episode where uh, one of the people in the show who used to be, like, a Hollywood manager Mm. quit her job and, like, moved into volunteering. And then she (laughs) went to a Hollywood party and literally no one could see her. And it's just weird. Like, uh, these were produced, like, long apart. I don't think anyone ripped off anyone, but it was just funny that Mm. I watched that in very recent times. Yeah, right. I mean, you could. All, it would be a very wacky moment to, to be that to be part of the plan of breaking in. That if you're not famous, no one's going to pay attention to you. Yeah. But uh, or once you get past security. Mm. But uh, I, I like what we have more. But yeah, it wasn't much of anything anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, with the wackiness as well, we talk about like the animation production as well. Like, yeah, what do we think of the whole like Met Gala thing? Do you think like it did a good parody of that? I think they yeah. designed a good dress for Marge. Mm. <laughs> If, if yeah, there's she a quick, looked great. <laughs> if there's a quick airlines fashion corner, wink. Wink. <laughs> um, I don't know how to describe it because I don't know fashion. Anyway, back to the episode. Uh, <laughs> it's like a, there's like a big splitty thing down the side. And it's, it's got like a floofy swoop. This is... <laughs> Can you help us out, Beck? We know nothing about <laughs> clothing. <laughs> I'm not your person either. No. Nah. Um, <laughs> if it ain't pants, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dress. She looked great. You don't get around people to watch the Met Gala every year, is it on? I don't know. Yeah, every year. So. Yeah. 
But like on the um on the look of the the Met Gala thing, I was just gonna say that I think that like they did a good job of sort of filling it out with um background sort of people and mm. um movement and things in an animation sense in the background. Mm. I thought it looked like good. Yeah. yeah, and I definitely did pop for Kent Brockman's lines of uh this theme is the audacity, as opposed to last year's themes, which was the nerve. <laughs> yeah. <so> funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't really hang on it too much, but yeah, I appreciated mm-hmm. those sort of sly little comments about the whole yeah, Met and the, Gala and you know, like we're here at the Museum of Generational Wealth or something like that. Yeah, yeah something like that. I think yeah. Met Gala tickets cost like 30 grand or something, don't they? Yeah, and you have to be like invited and yeah. shit. And... So yeah, for an episode as well that actually wasn't too wacky animation wise, but like we get into a bit of stylistic production as well with the whole heist angle as well, don't mm. we? And all the like chirons just swish, swishing underneath. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I kept waiting for like a bigger punchline from the Chirons. We never really got because what is it? I think it's the book heist where they have like the ad break kind of swooshes up right before that yeah. and things like that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's interesting that they're doing this because, yeah, again, probably haven't seen this episode back, but uh, they did, uh, I think it's season 23, a uh, heist episode called The Book Job where they even recruited Neil Gaiman to help mm-hmm. uh, them. Oh, nice. He is fantastic in that episode, by the way. (laughs) Um, Highly recommend that one. And yeah, they employ him to like write a book that's going to be appealing to the masses as well. And like they do it on this heist format. So, Mm. but yeah, they leaned into it so heavy there. And it's almost like this episode, Mm. um, they kind of backed off on it a bit stylistically. Surprising, because once we get into it proper, it's very close to Ocean's 8. And it feels like they should have continued to run with that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think the big payoff joke with the Chirons was at the end where uh, it turns out Lindsay Nagel had a bunch of other people stolen jewellery as well. And they uh, get them returned. And and then the Chirons are like, the double revenge you didn't see coming. But now you're like, what? Yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, fine. (laughs) Yeah, I I agree. All right. How about on the other side? How was the heart? How was the emotional core of the episode? Look, we learn what we've all known for many years is that just women love World War II. You, yeah. That's why they're always giving out like DVDs and books to their husbands. It's it's yep. why they love going to see battleships. Mm-hmm. Uh, the unspoken romance between women in the Second World War is finally, <laughs> finally <laughs> represented in modern media. And I, for one, am thrilled. I've been waiting all my life for this. <laughs> <laughs> It was a good turn. That it was fine enough as a one-off joke, but then I love that when Police Chief Wiggum and Homer do come up to the the uh, battleship and Captain Bowditch, like that's his immediately first thought is to reference mm. that. It was all right. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty good. As like a solo line, it wouldn't have been any good, but as a throwback, it worked really well. So I like that. <laughs> mm. Um, but yeah, like the new friendship between Sarah and Marge. How did we like how that rolled out? It, this is kind of my big sticking point I have this on this one as well, is it kind of just stops and it feels like it needs a yeah. bit more of a cap, especially between Sarah and Marge, because that's really the main focus of the episode. And after the heist is done, it's just credits. It's over. Yeah. It's like, mm. oh, that, you kind of need a moment with them, you know. Could have been a better saying, end credit scene, maybe. Yeah, even that. <laughs> yeah. Or being like, mm-hmm. you know, well, Marge, I'm going to have to lay low for a while now, but it's been nice getting to know you as a friend and heist partner. Mm. And something i don't know or Gives her the um the flask or something yeah, yeah or even exactly Mars being like this was fun but that's all the adrenaline i'll need for the next 10 years so i'll see you around in a very normal capacity mm. i don't know something um yeah i mean i did like them originally bonding where yeah sarah's bitching about chief wiggum and it's just like mm-hmm. uh he, you don't know what it's like to have a husband work a dangerous job he's not good at well like, actually it's a good a good dialogue that part yeah. yeah, I look. There were some very. There was definitely some Marge limes I popped for. Like one was, you know, Sarah offers her the bottle. She's like, "Oh, I've never done a swig." I'm like, "Okay, that's that's pretty good." <laughs> and even when she's trying to get to know Sarah, and she's like, "Hey, ever been on a battleship before?" Probably. Mm. What's your favorite way to start a conversation? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that might almost be a good conversation starter. I'm going to try that in the wild one day. <laughs> Just when you're awkward and out of things to say yeah, when you're so, trying to make no, small No, not even talk. out. Like, first pitch. So, what's your favourite <laughs> way to start a conversation? <laughs> we should have started this podcast that way. Damn it. Oh. Mm, that, what's your favourite way to start a podcast? Well. <laughs> by plugging all the other stuff that we do. Mm. Uh, and that's by, the way I like to win By guiding team. people to other podcasts? What are you, crazy? <laughs> <sighs> Um, but yeah, look, it's not going for a big heart sort of thing though. Um, mm. like it's, 
nice like that marge yeah. gets a little bit more of a focus i mean even still yeah, these look, days it's like uh, she's I'm still very glad this was a marge focus episode that didn't turn into the homo show because mm. that mm. happens so often and this was very good that it stuck with marge and i do have another little note of heart which is i like they uh the the two other heist members they got matching duck tattoos in prison oh that was adorable <laughs> <laughs> Again, funny, because on uh, AEW recently, there's a story of two female wrestlers who's like, one of them's gone a little loopy, and the other one's like, remember who you were, we got these matching tattoos, and they were of ducks. <laughs> Yay. Ducks. Just, they're good. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to Timeless Tony Storm versus Deonna Perazzo at Revolution. Uh, check out my review on Good AEW coming in March. Anyway, <laughs> plugging on. I didn't know on. what any of those words meant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping someone out there will understand it. Otherwise, links in the show notes. Uh, but ultimately, did this feel like an episode of The Simpsons? Now, I'm going to turn to you first, Beck. Like, yeah. uh, from what you've seen and this, do you think this is sort of kind of uh, consistent with what you've seen before? Like, what do you reckon? Um, I think like more or less, yes, uh, internally and stuff like that on a broad mm-hmm. level, I guess. But um, based on some of the things we we're talking about before, and I found this when I was watching it as well. That there was, I think, there were a few more sort of disjointed kind of uh, plot Mm. points, like the whole Ralph thing um, and everything like that, that made it feel less cohesive than the old episodes I remember. Mm. Um, But tonally, animation-wise, and the sort of like, you know, sort of ham-fisted digs um, at certain (laughs) social, you know, constructs and things like that felt very Simpsons to me. Like, I definitely felt like I was watching a Simpsons episode. Yeah. Yeah. from my very sort of fundamental perspective. Yeah. Mm. And how about you, BT, as a veteran of the Simpsons yeah. War? Uh, <laughs> I, I know this is, you know, it's not your classic era, but it's definitely above, you know, y- your teens and your 20s. So it's an improvement. It's But yeah, there's some jokes that are pretty flat and don't, mm. that are just there to like, to be a joke and it doesn't work. Like... When, you know, Homer finds out they're seeing Bob Seger, he goes, oh, what kind of bullet band is he performing with? The Silver. It's like, first of all, again, I don't know what that means. I, I can get it from context, but it's not funny. It's just a line. It's um, intensely few, laboured. Yeah, it's it's something like it definitely needs some refinement and you can really see that. And we've already made suggestions on how on improvements. Yeah, look. I, I, yeah, I, for the most part, I would say, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah, totally back you guys' points. And yeah, just uh, would add that it's just yeah lacking the humor for me it's um yeah you mentioned the few dud jokes and mm-hmm. um i don't know maybe if it's just because i don't pay attention to the met gala or whatever or maybe this is uh something that really rings true for people but the actual scenes of the party at the simpsons house with um like smithers and helen lovejoy and patty and selma and julio and all that i don't think any of what they said was very funny it was just like snarky comments and like I don't know. Yeah, I feel like, like there's a bit more... First draft snark. Yeah. yeah. Like, come on. And it was the like, same thing over and over again. Dude. That mm. guy looks like garbage and BTS looked like seven garbage. Like, wow, you stay up late for that one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but where there were like ridiculous like Simpsons-isms like when Marge first arrives at the Met Gala it's like, oh, there's the stairs and there's the throne and oh, the Swarovski wheelchair ramp and just... Mm-hmm. The, yeah. And then like saying, oh, Rihanna, I've listened to the clean versions of all your songs. Like, that is... I such like a that. Simpsons joke. It is such a Marge line. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, again, Marge got some great ones in this. No, like for all of like Sarah Wiggum's like again retconning, I say in big quotation marks because she wasn't much mm. of a character beforehand. Yeah. It's actually kind of nice that she gets something to do for once. Yeah. And- Look, we've talked a lot about after thirty-two seasons, go into the lives of B characters. We are ready to explore the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's one that like not a lot of other characters. You can say that for The Simpsons, where there's things being established, and like yeah, for as much as they're retconning Sarah here, yeah, it's a nothing character. But like Marge for me is the one that's truly on point in this one. Yeah, yeah, because we know she does love a little bit of gossip and does like a little bit of cattiness every now and then. And I also really liked her line at the beginning of you know they're talking about she's going to watch the gala and she's like i'm working up the courage to use the b word on a man (laughs) (laughs) bless you marge you will one day uh Mm -hmm. but yes or no would you watch this episode again you know what yeah i reckon so it's entertaining enough which is a sounds like a scathing indictment but still it's i had a good time and i'm surprised as well Hmm. how about you back 
Yeah, it was fun. I think there was enough uh, little dialogue quips in there that I'd pick up extra stuff on a second watch and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I'd watch it again. It was it was a bit of fun. Yeah, I would want to watch it again with someone who's more familiar with the back hour and like, was that joke funny? You know? <laughs> yeah, or like, mm. are there any details we missed or, you know, things like that? Because hopefully there are some background references that we just didn't get. Yeah. Um, but yeah, episodes that we might want to watch again, we like to think about what playlist we'd put them in. Uh, are there any other Simpsons episodes that remind you of this one? Well, the book job we've already said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What else has got a heist? I don't know. How about the one where the Krusty's daughter and they have to steal the violin back? Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess anything with the mob, but not really. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing. You can't even build a Sarah Wigan playlist because, like I said, she hasn't had any feature episodes. She's just, she's had featured jokes, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, one of the jokes was that she was in in the old days was that no one knew her name. So when Police Chief Wigan goes, Sarah, get me the mayor or whatever, we didn't know it was her until she picks up the phone and gets the mayor for it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. But uh, what would you like to change? We like to think about how we'd improve the episode. BT, tell me, how would you like to change this one? Just tighten up them dogs. There's a lot of things that just don't need to be there that would really streamline your story. Uh, We can probably get into this a lot faster as well because I want to free up some time for a proper ending and a final scene between Marge and Sarah and just a bit more of a conclusion. Like maybe there's a double cross to the double cross to the double cross. I don't know what, but it just kind of stopped. And mm. that's a shame because I was quite enjoying this. I'm sitting there watching and thinking, please stick the landing. And I don't think they flubbed the landing, but I would also not say they stuck it. Sure. That's going to be my main one. We even talked about, you know, you don't need to trick the kids to go into bed early. It can yeah. literally just be all. And I like the idea that Sarah Wiggum is just like being quiet to stay out of the limelight because she knows she's hiding from people. That works as well. And then it doesn't require her to like pull out a whiskey bottle and suddenly be interesting. Mm. Because, again, it just implies she's just tanked the rest of the time, <laughs> which is funny, but if it had come up, I don't know. It, it It's not a plot point I wanted to see there. It's just, you know, there's, there are more efficient ways to do a lot of this, and that's what I want. Mm-hmm. How about you, Beck? Yeah, I think, like we sort of spoke about before, I'd get rid of the mob slash Ralph plotline entirely Mm. i think because i didn't really add much to the overarching plot and it felt a bit sidetracked um and instead you know spend more time developing the relationship between sarah wiggum and marge and um perhaps even develop the sort of uh whole oceans eight ism the heist aspect of it with the other female thieves and i think that would have given it more um of a sort of like uh, i was sort of going for an underlying feminist context but it was Mm. kind of lost Mm. in the source a little bit with all these subplots and i think grounding it more in that would have been uh, a little bit more i guess realized i suppose yeah uh, that is such a good point because i I, and i feel like especially like they're just almost dipping their toes in the heist thing. They're not, yeah, fully committing and uh, getting neck deep in the water, yeah. as it were. It's just yeah. like it's a few Chiron jokes and the you know hmm. heavy bass jazz music, you know. Yes. Yeah, because like when they announced that Lindsay Nagel was the one that betrayed them back in the day, I was like, oh, okay, we're getting some background on two characters, and then it could have been anyone at this point. Like it, there was nothing really. She had no Lindsay Nagel esque lines. Mm-hmm. No, that's the weird thing, because, yeah, Lindsay Nagel is a firmly established character, and I like how they play with that, jo- that joke where Marge goes, Lindsay Nagel, she has several uh, different executive jobs in, in town. Mm-hmm. Like, again, sort of playing with a character who's only ever been there to support a plot, not actually carry one, but mm-hmm. Lindsay Nagel is a strong character. She's a very corporate-speaking executive-type. Like, there is so much you can get into there, and yes. yeah, that they don't is pretty disappointing, because yeah, I think she could make a great villain in this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, just have a bit of, oh, that betrayal, <laughs> that was all about the bottom line, not about yes, you. Yes, I got a good deal out of that, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, we are here. It is time for our final notes. And now it's time, and now it's time for our final notes, everyone's final notes. Uh, Beck, do you have any final notes, uh, parts of this episode you might want to mention before we move on to the rankings? Um, I just think that, um, yeah, like I said, overall, um, it was pretty good. I liked the idea of it. Execution was, for the most part, pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. Could have been better, but um, like I said, I had fun watching it. I'd watch it again. Um, yeah, it was good. All right, BT, any notes? Oh, yeah. You know, I got a bunch. Uh, Let's see. I do like the uh, aircraft carrier they go to is called the USS ship with a name we're not allowed to say anymore and with good reason. (laughs) 
the yeah, I do like when uh, they put the bag on Sarah's head. And Marge is like Sarah, and then they put it on her head. And she goes Marge. <laughs> well, that was weird. Such a weird ad break. It is, but it got me. Um, the first Chiron just says back in the day. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, and set to Hollaback Girl by Gwen Stefani. Yeah, so we we have an era for when this took place. Oh, that's uncut. Yeah, time in the Simpsons. Don't think about it. Yeah, well, I mean, I like that they dated as well. Like, again, it's like, uh, but Marge was a teenager in the seventies. Whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. This is the situation we're in now. But I do like how they date the episode. Yeah, we stole wallets. We stole watches. We stole MP3 players, and they actually use the designs of really mm. like shitty looking early two thousands <laughs> MP3 players. Yeah, we can get them in cereal boxes and stuff. <laughs> Fully. Yeah. Okay, there is something to be said about, you know, the, sh- the the show being like, get ready to know Sarah, to find out more about Sarah Wiggum than you ever knew before, mm. and then having to fully recast and redesign her. It's like, yeah, I I know what you're doing, but it's, it's mm, there's something about that that hits a little strange. Be like, yeah, you, you're going to discover her unknown past as we completely change her. <laughs> um, there's a good line when, you know, uh, Sarah's being the honeypot to seduce Wigan back in the day. And she's all like, hey, I'm just working this night job to pay for my police academy. Isn't that free? Yeah, the first time. <laughs> good little <laughs> Wigan is incompetent without saying too much. And then especially when they've, you know, made love in the pile of letters and she runs away. And he's like, no, come back to pile. Yeah. <laughs> Will you marry me? Probably. Yeah, yep. that wasn't bad. Uh, she describes Ralph as smart in a way we haven't found yet, and that's quite yeah. good. Uh, I do like all the, you know, framed pictures on Fat Tony's wall. It's like, Chief Bungles investigation, Chief Bungles this. And Homer's like, hey, you look a lot like that Chief Bungles. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, just the fact that, you know, Marge caring about the Met Gala came back, I think is good storytelling and makes sense. Yeah, I didn't even mind, like, the people just, like, turning up at her house and... Like just like yeah, you can imagine she would be like, "I can't be here. I've made snacks for everyone, and I've left the key under the doorbell." Yeah, it's very in you know, her character. Didn't absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, my last note is the Met Gala has very uh, fashionable security guards. They got like a tartan something going on. I'm not too sure what it is. Mm. Like so Scotsman. again, didn't call attention to it either. It was just there. Yeah, and, and yeah, I didn't mention it before, but I do like the whole twist in the story that they've got this plan, and Marge instantly figures out what's going to not yeah. work about it and use her as a Kmart smarts about her, as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I-, I thought that was a good move for Marge. Um, the whole thing about the battleship sleepover thing, I think this was another like unnecessary part of the episode. It didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't need to be that detailed. It's just something mm. you sh- chaperone the kids for. There was no good jokes about... Like them being made to scrub and clean the rust on it, like I don't know. Yeah, wasn't really much in that, and even like seeing Bart and Lisa in little sailor outfits dancing around about how excited they are. Like, it's enough to say Lisa's excited for the history and Bart's excited for the firearms and stuff. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but or you can even flip that because you know women in World War Two. Am I right, fellas? (laughs) Apparently, (laughs) I love those World War Two books. So well, you heard it here first, people. <laughs> <laughs> the episode is based in Day. fact. <laughs> Get a World War Two stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, that's about all my notes anyway. It is time to rank this thing. So, but before we do that, Beck, mm. we must ask you yes. another question. But it <laughs> yep. is arguably, no, not arguably, definitely the most important question we ask. Mm. Yes. I passed the responsibility over to BT. It's too great. The question is too important. Yes. Okay. Right. So, we like to ask our first-time guests, Mm. if you could have a sandwich named after you, what would be on that sandwich? So, if I'm in, you know, the world of darkness, I'm in (laughs) an outback town, I'm I'm a little bit hungry, but I'm a human. I want a sandwich, not blood. Mm. And I walk into a diner where there are some mysterious characters lurking in the shadows, and I order either the Beck or the Zeit Poltergeist, because I like your handle. Yeah. (laughs) What am I getting? What gets put on the plate in front of me? Mm. You are getting a freshly made... Beef patty. She knows. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've done on the grill just behind the counter. Um, mm-hmm. Three cheeses, you know, cheeseburger style, but yeah. um, with a rasher of bacon. I like a fried egg as well. Mm-hmm. And then just a couple of tomatoes, salt and pepper. And then you yeah. sear each side of the uh, the sandwich bread on either side mm-hmm. with a bit of butter. Um, so it has that burnt butter taste to it. That's my sandwich. 
Oh, damn, the lady knows what she likes. Okay, now, <laughs> is it separate kinds of cheese or all the same one? Nah, you got to have mozzarella tasty and maybe yeah. like a, a parmesan or a colby or See, something. See, I had a feeling mm. you knew, and this is why I need a detail. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> no, there's so many times where people are like caught off guard or deer in headlights mm. and like, no, nah, mm. you yeah, came this was in. You... <laughs> I, even, I even gave some vamp to give you some think time. You did not need it. <laughs> <laughs> you even gave some vamp-related vamp. Yeah. Oh, there's always <laughs> thoughts of food swimming around in my head. I promise. <laughs> no, especially me. I, I'm gonna. I, I haven't had dinner yet, so yeah. After this, yeah, that I, sounds hell good. You're gonna be uh, craving burgers now. But um, let's get some zites. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but until then, yes, it is now time to rank this thing. Uh, so on the Simpsons index, we rank using a six point scale that starts down the bottom at failure. Maybe if the episode was just meh, you give it a participant. But for positive rankings, you are OK Bronze, Good Silver, Excellent Gold, and for the best of the very best, you give Cubic Zirconia. I'm going to go first. Let me show you how it's done. Uh, look, uh, I'm close to a silver, but it's the humour that's getting me in this one is mm-hmm. that I only like have jokes that I've written down here. It's like, yeah, that's funny in theory, but I, I didn't laugh. Like, i got to be honest. Like, mm-hmm. um, And a few of the minor story problems, but it's still an okay time. Like, So that's why yeah. I landed on bronze with this one. Uh, BT, take it away. Yeah, I realised about the halfway mark. I'm like, okay, I'm at a bronze. If they can tie this story together at the end, if they can stick the landing, I might be up on a silver and I left on a, the you know left watching it on a bronze and like okay but the discussion maybe that will bring me up and no it just cemented my opinion that yeah it's it's really competent and it's got some you know I I actually did have a couple of laugh out loud moments but ultimately there are there's just a few few too many plot threads that don't need to be there and are left hanging and the fact we don't get a proper conclusion for Marge mm. really feels like it's lacking so it just needs like two more passes through of the script and I think it would be brilliant but yeah as it is I'm on a bronze and Beck please finish it off um, yeah I um in that scheme of ranking I um would have said silver I think um even with some of the plot discrepancies just because I think the narrative for the most part was very mm-hmm. well realized and stylistically musically um it all for the most part made sense but um it was that ending where everything sort of seemed to fall apart at the seams a little bit they started to focus more on the strange Ralph side plots and less on the sort of uh, the the relationship that was being formed between mm. Sarah Wiggum and Marge. So um, yeah, I think I'd give it a bronze as well, despite um, much of the story feeling okay. There was just those little tendrils of uh, strange randomness that I think bring it down for me as well. Yeah, but I mean, good score overall, and like way better than a lot of season thirty two episodes get. Uh, that's for mm. sure. Uh, well done, uncut fems. Yeah. Um, and yeah, once again, thank you, Beck, so much for joining us today and helping us Thanks review for this one. Me. Of course, uh, that was fun. Absolutely. And if people want to find you on the internet, where can they do so? Um, yeah, I'm at uh, Zeit Poltergeist or some iteration of that handle on pretty much all the social media. I'm mostly on either Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it these days, or um, Instagram um, at the moment. I also have a Twitch channel, Zeit Poltergeist. Um, and um, you can find me soon on Dread GM's channel again when we start mm-hmm. up with uh, Call of Cthulhu once again too. But I'll be around. Yeah, uh, by the time this episode uh, releases, uh, that'll be two days ago. So <laughs> go oh, back amazing. in time and watch us. <laughs> <laughs> you can time travel, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's at twitch.tv slash GM. Uh, we're, yeah, starting up our Call of Cthulhu campaign again for 2024. Mm-hmm. Uh, spoiler alert, my character died at the end of the last oh, it was season. Awful. So it was awful. <laughs> I will be reinvented. I think Dread keeps all the VODs up. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, if you want to go check that out, uh, we had a great time last year doing that, and, yeah, I can't wait to hook back yeah, into okay. it. and Can't mm-hmm. wait to find out what my new character is and all about. Oh, I'm <laughs> very scared and excited for that. Yes. Will he wear a hat? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> Uh, uh, BT, well, how about us? Where, where can people hear more of us? Well, people can venture on over to patreon.com slash sidequest studios and get access to over like 130 exclusive podcasts, which is Crazy Town Banana Pants. And that's, a, that's for as little as you, you, you could buy you know, a complete set of seven sided dice for like five times that amount. Oh my God, we're over 160. Sorry. I was like, 160. Holy shit buckets. Uh, I don't pay attention to these things. Elliot does. <laughs> so I just do the episodes. Just do the line. 
Yeah, so that covers everything like Except When He's Not. That's the show where we catch me up on the episodes I was not here for. Or our newest, I say newest, but we've done like 50 episodes of it. Yep. Uh, starring Springfield, where we review movies that star the cast of The Simpsons. But as you've never seen them before, sometimes we see their faces and stuff. It's weird. Yeah, so we've reviewed such a wide array of things. It, oh, yeah. You know, the criteria is movies that Simpsons cast members have been in. It's such a mm-hmm. weird thing where we have to rank them on the same scale, you know, ranking the movie Heat or Taxi Driver in the same mm-hmm. way that we rank <laughs> Chicken <Lackiness> Little. Scale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to find out what uh, what movie Yardley Smith says fucker, you, we can tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's important knowledge. <laughs> it is. And we know now. Yeah, the voice you, of Lisa asking, when do I get a diaphragm? Uh, the legend of billy jean by the way uh but yeah one of the patreon perks is that you get to suggest movies for us to review as long as they star a cast member of the simpsons we'll review it Mm -hmm. and yeah so you can go check that out at patreon.com slash sidequest studios links for all our stuff in the show notes uh finally Mm -hmm. beck once again thank you so much for being here tonight no worries. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I had so much fun. No worries. And we'll surely get you back again. I think we'll mm-hmm. try and do an episode with the full cast of the uh, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. And yeah, we'll have a good <laughs> time. Heck yes. I love it. Awesome. And BT, thank you as always. If you've listened this long, I'd woggle on you. <laughs> and Throw I'll... back to the beginning. Yeah. And I've been your host, Elliot J. O'Neill. That's all the mustard in the house. What's your favourite way to end a podcast? (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Simpsons Index podcast, which is also an online spreadsheet available at thesimpsonsindex.com. You can also check out our other shows, like Pulp Fury Radio, our scripted fiction podcast, which tells all original stories across a range of pulp genres, and Thrones of Game, where we review Game of Thrones in reverse order. Links to those podcasts and more will be available in the show notes. Now there's no bonus scenes for this episode, so we'll catch you next week.